In the last session, we took a look at the scene where the Israelites failed to enter the promised land which was right before their eyes. They left Egypt watching the spectacular work of the splitting of the Red Sea as well as the Ten Plagues. Even thereafter, they continually witnessed God's amazing power, yet they neither changed their heart into truth nor demonstrated spiritual faith. At last, they couldn't reap the fruit of blessing prepared by God. They returned to the wilderness and wandered there for as long as 40 years. That period wasn't just a time of retribution for the first generation who failed to display faith. It was the time of spiritual training for the second generation who would enter, who would conquer Canaan. They were given time to experience God and possess faith. Israel had to suffer trials for many years for not having true faith in the depths of their heart. It's the same today. Before God blesses His children, He has them go through several steps to have spiritual faith. Can you have spiritual faith just by being given good things and shown power without training? That's not the case. Even though you've watched and experienced great and amazing power, that doesn't mean you have spiritual faith unless you circumcise your heart. Thus, when tempted, you change your heart, you are quick to complain and forsake His grace. So this is not true faith. Plants grown in the greenhouse, no matter how beautiful and healthy they look, once they are exposed to rain and wind, they get bent and even pulled out. That's why, through discipline, God makes us sturdier and more truthful and helps us have spiritual faith. But this process may cause some fruits to fall from the tree and reveal the chaff which looked like wheat but is actually empty on the inside. The farmer may be saddened and distressed to see the fruits falling and many of his grains turning out to be chaff despite his toil and de- dedication. Yet, because the chaff is no use at all, he disciplines us through the human cultivation. Without spiritual faith, you cannot enter heaven, and even after you receive blessings, in nine cases out of ten, you would go back to the world. But if God blesses you after you have spiritual faith, you'd be more grateful and faithful to God and have hope for heaven. With your soul prospering day after day, you will get into deeper spiritual levels. That's why God shows us amazing works of power and sometimes permits fiery trials so that we can have perfect faith and come forth as the best fruit. We have gone through such process. Uh, We go through such process continually. It doesn't just happen once or twice. But until we enter heaven, until we recover the lost image of God completely, we go through this process continually. You know, little children enter elementary school, but they don't just take tests once or twice. Every season they take a test, and they also have to, as they go up in grace, they have more tests, and they they take harder tests. It's the same. As we live a life of faith, in order for us to have perfect faith, we have to go through tests. So we shouldn't call such tests hard or arduous, but we have to strive to recover the lost image of God. We, so we have to become victorious with gratitude and joy, joy. But in the process, there are fruits or trees that fall down. It looks like they were strong. but they fall. But with man's thoughts, it it is so regrettable that but as we look at the process of the actually, we will look at the scene where the Israelites say goodbye to Moses and they begin to march towards Canaan with Joshua and there are several significant incidents that give us lessons. This message is based on what senior pastor preached back in in the last session they sent 
the spies and there was a rebellion of Korah and his followers. As we look at during the 40-year trial in the wilderness, the first generation of the Exodus tried to storm Moses and continually disobeyed. There are many such incidents in our Christian life. We may have those times when we grow in faith peacefully, but as we become arrogant, we may go down in faith. We may backslide in faith. The title of today's message is, I mean, we will, I mean, today, Moses leave a last will and they leave a word of exhortation. Moses give instructions to the Israelites on what they had to do. We will take a look at it later on. As we look at his words of exhortation, he said, the land of Canaan, which God gave you. And he exhorted them not to change their heart. And he exhorted them again and again. That takes up a lot of part of the exodus. It feels like he is just repeating words, but and the Israelites were united in heart hearing this message and marched forward toward Canaan. But in the book of Judges, after Joshua died, not long after that, the Israelites again forgot what Moses told them. You know, in the last week, you received grace when you heard the message and you received grace. But how did you hold on to the message and how did you apply the message into your life? Some of you may forget what you heard. If so, you're just passing time. You're not What God wants from us is to become the best wheat, the best fruit. You know, there were two million people. God chose Moses. There were many, so many people. There were... God just... As we go through the human cultivation, we have to... I mean, the the length of our life of faith does not matter in receiving blessings and receiving the spiritual authority. What matters is how we engrave in our heart what we've experienced and change our heart and have spiritual faith. We have to circumcise our heart Only then can we have spiritual faith. In this church, in this church, we've seen numerous signs and wonders which are never lesser than those in Moses' time. We've heard profound words of God. But just having what we've seen and heard as knowledge is no use at all. Thus, we should now have spiritual faith. So no matter what task is ahead of us, what is the task? The task may be difficult. The task may be tough. Even so, we should ably carry it out with joy and gratitude. The most important thing for us is the salvation. When when our Lord comes back, the evaluation of our faith is over. When we are saved, it's after the millennium is over, At the time, we are judged at the the moment when we are saved, we know exactly what our measure of faith is. But now we have to change ourselves and we have to break ourselves and we are marching towards Canaan. We also have the duties of the world evangelization and the construction of the Grand Sanctuary. Also in our life of faith, there are moments when we have to demonstrate our faith. Just like the Israelites went through tests, 
they had to go through steps we have to go apply them to our life of faith and we have to check ourselves whether we demonstrated our faith whether we took a step closer to Canaan whether we are just wandering around the wilderness in our life of faith that's a waste of time whether we we have to look from today Israel's journey of taking the land flowing with milk and honey begins in earnest hopefully this message will help you to check once again whether you indeed have spiritual faith and to come forth as spiritual warriors By doing so, I pray in our Lord's name that as warriors of faith, you will take the lead when God commands us to conquer Canaan. While the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, the entire first generation died. Only Moses, Joshua, and Caleb survived with the second generation. As their entry into Canaan neared, Moses gathered the people and gave a long speech. Before his death, it was after they wandered in the wilderness, they marched toward, they were in the plain of Moab. That's where they heard a last will from Moses. On the plains of Moab, there was some incidents. They also won battles. They after they wandered in the wilderness and according to God's command they were marching they were on the verge of entering Canaan and there they received a last will before his death a father would be concerned about his children left behind Likewise, with a heart of concern, Moses gave words of exhortation to Israel that would carry on the great task of of conquering Canaan after he finishes his life on earth. Let me give you one request. We are now having another uh, book reading campaign. You know, in addition, I also I also recommend you read the book of Deuteronomy, which gives you a lot of grace. The the words were not just for the Israelites, but the words are for us. Moses continually made a request. As you read the book of Deuteronomy, you can see how Earnestly, Moses pleaded, exhorted the people of Israel. As you read such words often and remember the words well, it it would be easier for us to obey God's word. So, if you have time, I recommend you read the book of Deuteronomy. And the main point of the book of Deuteronomy is to keep God's commandments. Moses said, So you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. Moses said that they will have a longer life in the land which they long for. He told them not to turn to the right or to the left or have a change of heart or be double-minded with doubts. He urged them to keep the words of God as they are. He also said, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. He didn't say, I mean, Moses didn't say they should only keep what is easy and not what is difficult, but he said that If they kept all the commandments, God's blessings would come. And Sr. Pastor also said, 
those who love God first keep all the commandments. People easily say, I love God, but they only keep what is easy. They offer services on Sunday. They don't take in worldly things, but they stay home and they try to worship God with all their heart. It's good. But as they go out into the world, in their workplaces, they hate others. They quarrel with people. They also have ill feelings against others. You know, it is also a sin to cease to pray. If you sin, you belong to the devil. We shouldn't just consider it... uh, We have to take this seriously. We know that it is a blessing to keep His words. But if we depart from the word, we become the prey to the enemy devil. And in many parts of the Deuteronomy, God says that if we keep His commandments, we are blessed. But if we forsake His words, we suffer His curse. When the entire nation keeps God's commandments, it would stand out among all nations. When Israel perfectly abided by God's word, it enjoyed prosperity, receiving tributes from the neighboring countries. But when it left the word of God, the people continually suffered attacks and ended up being taken captive. The same applies to churches. When a church lives by God's word, it would enjoy God's love and His presence and excel other churches. The same goes for your business, families, or personal life. With each member keeping God's commandments, a business would prosper, and a family would be happier and stronger than any other family, and the family would be admired by others. Also, as each of you lives by the word, you can excel others. You can excel any person in the world. But if a person forsakes his commandments, you may say, you didn't forsake his commandments. I know that, you may say, I know that he is the master of all creation. But Father God says that if we don't keep his commandments, we disregard him, we forsake his commandments. If a person forsakes his commandments, he will get stricken with various diseases and curses, as we find in Deuteronomy chapter 28. We know that the Deuteronomy chapter 28 is the chapter of blessing. We learn what kind of blessings we will receive in that chapter. But in the later parts of the chapter, we learn what kind of curse we may face if we don't keep His commandments. That's what we learn in the chapter of Deuteronomy. Don't be mistaken here. This word was not intended to frighten or trouble the people, as the Bible says, and to keep the Lord's commandments and His statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Moses will Moses was only presenting the best way for them to live happily forever. Parents, you you say this and that to your children. You tell them not to associate with wrong kinds of people. Why do you do so? For your children's happiness, for your children's well-being. Your children may argue, I don't want to do this, but why do you ask me to do it? You parents tell them to do so because you love them. It's the same way. Father God tells us not to commit sins because we may suffer troubles and death by committing sins. We may complain. It's difficult to live by the words. If we complain, if we hate others, if we quarrel with others, if we fight against others, it feels like we are overcoming them. But Father God tells us not to do so. He is not troubling us. He is not bothering us. But He is saying this to bless us. Since Adam committed a sin, the enemy devil and Satan have held the authority over this world, and fleshly people have suffered from all kinds of trials and tribulations living under their authority. Only when God protects us can we escape the authority of the darkness and live amidst blessings. 
to make this happen, we should keep the Word of God who is light and depart from the darkness. As long as we don't live in His Word, we belong to the darkness. Only when we live in the Word, we belong to the light. As the Bible says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Those who don't keep the commandments dwell in the darkness. Naturally, they belong to the enemy devil, the governor of the darkness. Then, even when the enemy devil gives them trials and tribulations, the God of justice cannot protect them. Because it's not against the justice for the enemy devil to bring trials and tribulations to the people of the darkness. While those people profess to believe in God, but they live what, according to what they please the enemy devil. That's why the enemy devil would say, There are, you belong to me. If you, in workplaces or in your families, if you hate others, if you call others, and if you don't act, act according to the word of God, you, you are not the man of God. But the enemy devil would say, You are mine. That's why you suffer tribulations and trials. Still, Father God does not forsake us because you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But even so, He cannot protect you because you belong to the enemy devil. As we keep the laws of the country, we can be protected by the police. Likewise, as we keep the laws of God, we belong to Him and He can protect us. But, but, but when we don't keep these laws, we belong to the enemy devil, so He can, lead, he can deal, us, deal with us at His discretion. It's not that Father God hates us just because we don't keep His commandments. Father God wouldn't say, Did you commit sins? So I'm giving you trials. That's not the case. Just because we, because we don't keep His, keep His words, even though we profess to believe in God, we get out of His protection. As a result, the enemy devil brings us trials and tribulations. To keep the words of God means to be inside God's protection. So we shouldn't be out of that protection. While we profess to believe in God, we shouldn't get out of His protection. Then, the enemy devil will mess with us. So Father God cannot help us. While we are within the law of God, we, the enemy devil cannot come near us. Even though the enemy devil tries to give us trials, Father God protects us. We shouldn't say, Father God gave us trials and tribulations. It's because you didn't keep His commandments. that you are suffering trials and tribulations. So what you have to do is to repent. God feels so heartbroken when He sees people created in His image dwell in the darkness, become the prey to the enemy devil, and live in suffering. So, throughout the Bible, He repeatedly emphasizes that we should not commit sins and live in the darkness, but live in the light and receive His protection. Because Moses was well aware of God's heart, countless times he exhorted his dear fellow Israelites to keep his commandments. s i n a pastor did the same. He urged us not to commit sins, saying that it is death. He ta- taught us about sins leading to death or sins not leading to death. He repeated what he said. Just like he had a heart of Moses and a heart of Father God. We can feel that, right? I also urge you to engrave Moses' exhortation on your heart once again, perfectly keep the word of God, and always dwell in the light. Moses, the man of God, finally ended his 120-year life, which was full of ups and downs, In Moab, across the Jordan, east of the land of Canaan, he finished his life, a 120-year life. And he he didn't get blind. And as senior pastor explained about this sin, senior pastor said, you can, this, there is no question Moses himself had enough faith to enter Canaan. But as Moses said, the Lord was angry with me on your account. 
namely, on people's account. Moses bore responsibility as the leader of the first generation who lacked faith, so he himself couldn't enjoy the blessings of Canaan. But there are preachers who misunderstand the Bible and claim that Moses couldn't make it to the land because of his disobedience. I mean, some of them say that when people complain for water, God told Moses to hit a rock once, but he disobeyed it and hit it twice. That's why God was enraged. Some preachers claim. Others argue that Moses couldn't, you know, because Moses threw the stone tablets and broke them apart. That's why But God Himself acknowledged that He was humbler than any other man on the face of the earth. If Moses, who was the humblest man, had not been allowed into Canaan for getting angry once, how could he believe in such fear for God? Also, Moses never got angry for his own benefit. He came down with a stone tablet, and people were not patient and worshipped idols. Seeing this, he was... He was filled with righteous anger. That was out of his love for God. If this statement, the Lord was angry with me on your account, had not been recorded, the later generations could have misconceptions about Moses and God. So God had it recorded so that there would be no misunderstandings. Moses was a man of faith who obeyed the words of God from when he was given the duty of delivering the people out of Egypt until he finished his life. To become a leader of a nation takes a great deal of agony and burden, so it must have been never easy. He had to harbor the people with a fatherly of heart, and he always pondered over how to lead them to live in pursuit of God's will. Lamenting and agonizing for people who complain with evil words, he must not have spent a single day in comfort until he was called to heaven. The days he spent on shedding tears and mournfully praying for the people are just beyond words. Yet, Moses never avoided his responsibility or gave up his duty. He only bowed before God and humbly confessed that he was helpless on his own. No matter what kind of trouble he faced, he got through it only with faith in God. Because Moses had such an inner heart, God trusted and believed in him, communicated with him a lot, and manifested great works of power through him. As you carry out your God-given duties, have any of you thought, my duty is so burdensome, I want to take a break? If so, please remind yourself of Moses' mindset and press on with all the more fervent heart. To console Moses, God had him go up Mount God had him go up Mount Nebo, located each because Father God proclaimed that they would not be able to enter Canaan. Still, Moses. express his desire to enter Canaan. But still, God said, as as the leader of them, you cannot enter there. And Father God must have lamented for him. So God had him go up Mount Nebo, located east of Jordan, where he was able to overlook the entire Canaan. As God showed him the blessed land, He once again reminded him that it was the land God promised to the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though they were not able to enter Canaan, God reminded him that their descendants would enter there. Reminding him of that, Moses, God consoled him. And God selected Joshua as the leader to, among the 12 spies, who had entered Canaan, Joshua made a positive confession of faith. He d always waited on and followed Moses. When Moses fasted for 40 days to receive the Ten Commandments, he also fasted and stayed around him. The Bible says, His servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. In today's terms, he always longed for God's sanctuary and stayed close to it. 
Because Joshua loved God and longed for and stood by Moses with an unchanging heart, he was able to carry on with Moses' duties. Of course, Joshua could have felt burdened at first because his teacher, who he had to rely on, was no longer around and the great prophet's duties and responsibilities were handed over to him. Staying by Moses' side for 40 years, he must have watched his tears and agony closer than anybody else. So he knew so well what a great burden it was to lead numerous people in faith. But God repeatedly made firm promises, encouraging Joshua. He said, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses. I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Also, the Israelites who were with Joshua were different from the previous generation. They have changed. They were the second generation. They had been nurtured by God's word since childhood, witnessed numerous works of power, and suffered a 40-year trial. Many times, they were told why their parents failed to enter Canaan and why they suffered, and they engraved it on their heart. They were obviously different from their parents who planted much evil in themselves growing up in Egypt. They were fully prepared to wholly obey their leader who was established by God with true faith. Unlike unlike their parents who continually complain against Moses despite having experienced numerous works, they vowed that they would absolutely obey Joshua. They said, anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Right before they enter Canaan, they the three tribes were given some land I mean they had already taken some land of Canaan and Joshua told them to take the lead march forward and take other land as well As they heard Joshua's plea, they confessed, So, whatever you say, we will obey. We will say, Amen. All the people, as well as the leader Joshua, were united in one heart and will to fulfill God's promise regarding the land of Canaan. The first place the Israelites had to take over to enter Canaan was the city of Jericho, Joshua didn't recklessly advance to the city just because he had faith. He selected two spies and sent them. About 40 years ago, they sent 12 spies. I mean, it was not exactly 40 years. And after many years, after they had some battles, they were in a position to take the city of Jericho. And they sent two spies into the city. They needed to find out what the city was like, where the gates were, how how great the city's military was. And then they had to develop strategies accordingly. The walls of Jericho were such sturdy structures. As we check out the traces of the city of Jericho, excavated by the scholars, we find that what an impregnable fortress it was. Generally, city walls had a single layer, whereas the city walls of Jericho consisted of two layers, inner and outer walls. Moreover, the walls were each 1.8 meters and over 3.3 meters thick. Unless the city was hit with tremendous force, it was almost impossible to inflict even minor damage on it. At the time, the citizens of Jericho had put themselves on the highest alert for the attacks. You know, after they wandered in the wilderness, 
the second generation, the second generation was staying on the plains of Moab, and they heard the last will, and they marched, and as they marched, they had won great victory. as they marched on. And they, and even the Gentiles heard about their victory and heard about the great works manifested. Father God gave them the law and, and Father God said that if you live according to my will, I will bless you I, and that I'm your true God and you are my children. It is God's covenant. But Such covenant does not apply to Israelites alone. But Father God also showed to the Gentiles that He was God. And people with good hearts acknowledged it. And they obeyed the Israelites. People who... Along the way, Israel didn't always fight with them. Israel sometimes made peace with the Gentiles But as for Amalekites, Father God told them to destroy them because they could accept idolatry. But other times, they had a peace treaty with some Gentiles. They bought grains, they bought water, and they peacefully marched through. They made a suggestion. They made a suggestion like, "Please help us go through this land peacefully." But those Gentiles who didn't agree with the Israelites, they were killed. They marched on like this, and they. It was time before they attacked Jericho, but the inhabitants of Jericho knew that the Israelites were marching towards them, because that's why they put themselves on the. highest alert to protect themselves. They focused on, they were totally focused on their possible attacks. Hearing that the spies were in the city, the king of Jericho dispatched soldiers to capture them. The the two spies were trapped under tight security. and they were under tight security and they knew there was no way of getting out and their life was at stake like a lamp in front of wind while all people in the city were enemies how were they able to find help surrounded by those high and sturdy walls where could they find an escape but sometimes our God provides us with help from a totally unexpected person. The lifesaver of the two spies were the owner of the house they were staying in. She was a harlot named Rahab. Rahab was a Gentile woman and was of a low social class. But not only did she save their lives, but she made such an amazing confession of faith, saying, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. She was a Gentile. It's not that she heard a voice of God. No. But she made such a confession. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land All the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of Amorites and beyond the Jordan to Sion and Ak, whom you utterly destroyed. When you heard it, when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven and above and earth beneath. Being good-hearted, she acknowledged God's work even as a Gentile. When she heard about splitting of the Red Sea, the Israelites gaining landslide victories with God helping them in battles, and Moses hitting a rock and making water springing up, she only heard rumors. She didn't experience it herself. But she 
acknowledge that they were only possible by the Almighty God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. And she opened her heart. And she requested them to save her. She believed. She believed that it would happen. And she requested the spies to save her and her family during the Israel's impending attack, just as she saved them. As a result, even while the city was conquered and its citizens were all killed, she could save her family and herself. A more surprising thing was, later, Rahab married an Israelite and gave birth to Boaz, David's great-grandfather. The Bible says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and the Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. Jesse, who, uh, I mean, Jesus, who was to become the Savior, was born to David's descendant. So this Gentile woman was blessed to be included in Jesus' genealogy. But, involving men's thoughts, some may criticize her, saying she betrayed her people, hid the spies, hid the spies in her house, and she lied. She said, they already left. She provided misinformation. That's how the two spies survived. Hearing this, some people may say, she lied. She was a liar. She caused the city of Jericho to be be destroyed. With fleshly thoughts, she may be criticized. But you have to make a right discernment. What Rahab chose was not a specific ethnic group or people. She chose God, the Almighty Creator and the Master of all things. That's what she chose. Even as she was a member of the Jericho, she didn't choose Jericho. She wasn't she wasn't choosing between she was choosing God. Even as a Gentile, she had such a good heart, so when she heard the news about how God was with the Israelites and manifested amazing signs and wonders, she indeed believed in Him and was willing to obey His will. Despite being a Gentile, a person who was who has such a good inner heart, acknowledge God when she hears about marvelous works impossible by man. Even though they don't see it for themselves, just by hearing it, they acknowledge God. We find such people in the Bible. The general Naaman came before God's servant and knelt before him just by hearing about the servant from his little maid. The Roman centurion who Jesus met during his visit to Capernaum also had a good inner heart. So just hearing rumors about Jesus, he recognized who he was. From a fleshly perspective, Jesus was merely a young man of subject nation, but he humbly came before Jesus and asked him to heal his servant, showing his faith. Cornelius was also a Gentile centurion. But, having a good heart, he always prayed to God and devoted himself to helping the needy. His prayer finally reached God, so God saved his entire family. Like this, if someone is good, even though he is a Gentile, God makes sure to meet and bless him and lead him to salvation. As the Bible says, by faith Lahab the the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. This woman's deeds came from faith. To protect the two spies, God led them to the house of this woman who was good-hearted and acknowledged God. The saying The same went for Elijah, the man of God. There were a lot of widows at the time, but but God led him to the widow in Zarephath who would provide for Elijah. Even though someone is a... God knew that she would obey the man of God. He would even provide some bread. Without uh, showing these, she would not be able to be blessed. God gives him a test, and if that person passes the test, he is blessed. And the widow in Zarephath passed the test. 
Even though someone is a Gentile and of a low social class, if he seeks and relies on God with a truthful heart, God, who looks at our heart, never ignores him. He makes sure to repay him with blessings. Those with a good inner heart make a confession of faith just by hearing about the works of power, which are impossible by man. When the great works of power manifested by God covers the whole world, we'll witness numerous people from nations of the world coming with confessions like those of Rahab. For the accomplishment, Rahab had a good heart. She believed in the, just by hearing about the works manifested by God to Israelites, and through her deeds, her entire family was saved. But it's really hard to, difficult to find people with such a heart. I thought this was strange. Despite manifestations, manifestations of great power, why don't, why, how come people don't come here to, for a resolution of their problems? Despite manifestations of God's power, why, how come people don't come? But it's the heart of human beings. You know, there were so many people in Jericho, they all heard about God's works. They were frightened. Even though they were frightened, they, even though they were frightened, it's not that they opened the door to the city and welcomed the Israelites into, into their place. But they firmly closed the wall. I mean, how stubborn. That's why we need the power of recreation. Just, just, because people are spiritually blind, people are spiritually deaf, that's what human beings are like. It's not just about the worldly people. We, people here, were the same. We, they were told to cast up sins. We have to look back. We are just like the... That's why Father God puts us through trials and that's why s e n i o r Pastor is filling up the justice for the power of recreation. Even though as people witness such power, they cannot help but open their heart and accept it. For the accomplishment of such works, I ask in our Lord's name that all of you join in with more fervent prayer and deeds of faith. The spies who avoided a crisis by the help of the Gentile women hid themselves from the pursuers for three days and crossed the Jordan back into the camp of Israel. What confession did they make as they came back to Joshua? Do you think they said, we are frightened that the citizens are on the highest alert and that the city has two layers of wall? It would be extremely difficult to enter, conquer the city. They were, it's like the confession of the ten spies, but they didn't confess so. As s e n i o r pastors explained about the scene, he asked us to examine the confessions of our lips. Particularly, he urged the church leaders to check whether they were making God-pleasing confessions. The two spies gave a detailed report on what they'd seen and heard, but they never spoke with fear or negative words. They only made confessions based on what they'd seen with the eyes of faith. They said, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. When people make such confession of faith, there are people who say negative words. Like, did you meet all the people there? Do you know about everything in the city? How could you say so? Are you talking about the truth? There are people who... But no matter what they say, we have to march on with faith. Even after people see the same thing, the way each of them reports about it differs. Some people say encouraging and comforting words, while others say disagreeing. say discouraging and troubling words. Sina Pastor said, there are people who 
completely discourage me with words. Of course, it's best not to say any words that are not good in the first place, words that dishonor God or reveal others' faults. Throughout the Bible, God tells us to cover others' faults and not to point out or look at others' speck. But if we are in a position to report on something, such as if our leaders, to, we shouldn't cover up the situation. If there is a problem, we have to report on it. If, you, if we are in a position to report on something, we should always ponder over how we can make confessions of faith out of the situation, encourage other people, and please God with our confessions. In reporting, we shouldn't habitually say negative words, merely considering the reality. We have to fix that habit. Even among people out in the world, relations, relationships with people out in the world, especially if we want to if we see God's work even when we do secular work even we need God's help even when we do such things we shouldn't say negative things we have to fix that habit parents shouldn't say to their children they have to encourage them they have to cheer for them only then can they be strengthened and encouraged if we indeed believe in God nothing will be impossible or difficult even miserable situations can turn prosperous if we only say it will be impossible it will be difficult then it's like saying God is not with us how could we work with such people if we say such things again and again God will be disheartened since its founding this church has been marching vigorously for the world evangelization and the grand sanctuary from a realistic point of view there were situations unbearable and beyond our control Yet, marching ahead of us, our shepherd only acted in faith. As, we, as much as we obeyed, God du- directly guided us and took responsibility. Also, from now on, in everything we do to fulfill God's providence for this church, the shepherd and m a m i n we should only confess in faith and march forward. Thus, no matter the circumstance, we should always keep in mind that the Almighty God is watching us, He is examining how we speak and act with faith, whether we are united as one and try to fulfill God's will, encouraging and strengthening others, and how much we love God, the shepherd, and other brothers and sisters. God is examining our faith and the depths of our heart. And He works according to our faith. The Bible says, With the fruit of man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I ask in our Lord's name that you speak only words of faith and goodness in any situations so that you can plant strength and faith in those around you. Hearing the reports from the two spies, Joshua set out with the Israelites early the next morning to conquer Jericho. But before they entered Jericho, There was one issue to be resolved. It was, it was how to cross the overflowing Jordan River. When they reached the river, it was the season when the river overflew and had a strong current. So they had to think of a way for a tremendous number of people to cross the river at once. In the next session, we will talk about how the Israelites crossed the overflowing river. Our faith for God unceasingly protected Moses, the man of God, and his people. He guided them with the pillars of crowd and fire during the 40-year trial, and their clothes and sandals didn't wear out. It was by God's help that they did not die in the wilderness, lacking water and the food. This was amazing. It was true. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They didn't They they were not destroyed 
in the wilderness where they didn't have enough water and food. Also, their entry into the land of Canaan would be possible only with the presence of the Almighty God. In today's passage, God promised Joshua that He would be with them as well. He said, Be strong and courageous. Do not trouble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But there was a condition. It was to do according all the law which Moses commanded them, and not to turn to the light or to the left. Namely, as long as Joshua and Israel didn't just, this just this didn't just apply to Joshua, but to all the congregation. And this is also a word of blessing to all of us, but there is a condition. It was not to betray God. It is to live in His Word. As long as we do so, He will be with us forever. And they will enter Canaan and enjoy the blessings from the land. This is the promise given to us as well. God, who has been with us since the founding of this church, will unceasingly be with us as long as we dwell in His Word. Thus, we should try all the more to keep His commandments, circumcise our heart, and quickly finish adorning ourselves as the Lord's bride. By doing so, I pray in our Lord's name that all of you will take the lead in fulfilling the world evangelization and the construction of the Grand Sanctuary and play your respective roles when the whole world comes forth towards the glory of God. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and the internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis, and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bonds of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. 
Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.